Hi students, welcome back to the chapter 9 lecture. This will be part 3. I just covered an example with cats in terms of a dihybrid cross. That brings us to Mendel's law of independent assortment and a second example with uh, Mendel's pea plants. Mendel's law of independent assortment simply states that alleles are inherited independently of each other. Now there are caveats to be addressed later. As with a lot of uh, principles that you learn about in biology, there are oftentimes exceptions to those general rules, and we'll talk about that with linked genes a little bit later on. Okay, so what this is showing is we have a parental generation, the P generation, and we have a cross between uh, smooth uh, yellow and wrinkled green and their corresponding genotypes. The F1 generation produces these um, all smooth um, yellow, and then the F2 generation, we start to see the variation and the recombination coming out. So we'll see here that color and texture is not necessarily linked to one another. So we can end up with smooth green, and we can also end up with wrinkled yellow, for example. So that would indicate that those two alleles, the ones for texture and color, are inherited independently of each other. I'm going to talk briefly about probability rules. And it's useful to look at this uh, both in uh, the Punnett squares themselves and then also in predicting phenotypes of offspring. What this is showing us is just the formation of egg cells and sperm cells and how we actually get the, the, the numbers in the Punnett square here. So remember that an individual is only going to have two alleles for each locus. And each locus is going to correspond to a, a trait. Now it may be that multiple loci go into making up a single trait, and that would be a polygenic trait. For all of the traits that we've looked at so far, it's just a single locus, a single pair of alleles give you a complete phenotype. For example, purple flower color versus white flower color. Now in real life, many traits are polygenic. So hair color, for example, you don't just have hair color determined by a single pair of alleles. It's multiple alleles interacting with one another at multiple loci in your chromosomes that give you those traits, like hair color and eye color, for example. Uh, but this is just showing um, half, half of the eggs will end up with the big B allele and half will end up with the little b allele if the phenotype for the female is heterozygous dominant. And similarly for the male that's also heterozygous dominant, half of the gametes or the sperm cells will end up with the big B allele, half will end up with the little B allele, and then you can understand the, uh, the probabilities of these coming together in these different ways. So one half times one half will give you one fourth. And again, one half times one half will give you a fourth, etc. Now this is also useful for looking at uh, the worksheet that corresponds with chapter 9. Um, for example, let's say that you know, you're wondering what the likelihood of having um, a girl child followed by another girl child. Well, what's the probability of having a female child in the first place? It's just going to be one half. You can either have a boy or a girl, um, if, if we are to, to stick with traditional strict uh, biological sex characteristics. So we have one half times one half. That means that's the probability of having one girl, and then that would be the probability of having a second girl. In that order, the probability of having a girl followed by another girl is just 1 in 4, or 25%. Uh, so it's important to keep in mind that with, uh, with those word problems, with those worksheets, 
there are both com both true compound events and just singular events described. So, you know, the probability of having a girl followed by another girl is 25%. The probability of having a girl as your second child, you're not told any more additional information about that. What's the probability of having a girl as a second child? Well, it's just going to be one half because you don't know what the first child, what the sex of the first child was, for example. Let me know if you have any questions about uh, probability rules as it relates to the worksheet or any other examples. Okay, uh, using the cross for the Punnett square practice we did a few minutes ago, what's the probability that the parents will produce a heterozygous dominant offspring followed by a homozygous dominant offspring? Now I'm going to have to think back as far as what example we did that with. Um, let's see. Now let's just, okay, I think this was the one that we were talking about here. So big B, little B, big B, big B. Ooh, that's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Just got this tablet. Not super well versed in its use yet. We'll make it work. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> it's a little challenged. Um, okay, so what's the probability that the parents will produce a heterozygous dominant followed by a homozygous dominant? Okay, so what's the chance of a heterozygous dominant? Um, that's going to be 50%. And probability followed by a homozygous dominant. Homozygous dominant, that individual probability would be 50% as well. So what we would do is we would multiply those together. So 50% chance of producing a heterozygous dominant offspring followed by a 50% chance of producing a homozygous dominant offspring it would be a 25% chance. Um, what's the probability that the parents will produce a homozygous dominant followed by another homozygous dominant? Um, in this case, this is not a very exciting example, <laughs> but as long as you understand the principles of where this math is coming from, um, you can come up with some more creative examples and see how this works. So homozygous dominant followed by another homozygous dominant. Homozygous dominant, again, is just going to be 50% times Again, 50%, so 25% chance. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk briefly about some human disorders that are controlled by a single gene. Um, many human traits show simple inheritance patterns. There are more that show more complex inheritance patterns than simple, uh, but there are quite a few that show simple inheritance patterns. Um, here we have some examples. Some of these diseases will have more than one form of the disease, so they're not necessarily always going to be a simple case of, an, uh, case of simple inheritance pattern, but these are just some examples. Uh, Kurtzfeldt-Jakob disease, for example, this is the equivalent of mad cow disease in cattle and scrapie in sheep. It's a really interesting uh, disease that's um, another variation of this disease, you can actually pick that up from contaminated um, animal tissue. It's actually spread by a modified protein called a prion. It acts kind of like a virus, but it's actually a protein. Um, there, yeah, there are some really interesting cases here. Gigantism, for example, 
um, certain forms of colon cancer, certain forms of breast cancer. So these are all examples of simple inheritance pattern disorders in humans. Now, luckily for us and for our fellow mammalian species, a lot of disorders that are genetic in nature are recessive and you need two recessive alleles in order to actually express the disorder. So a lot of times individuals are carriers of the disease without themselves being affected by the disease. What that means is they carry a recessive allele that if it combines with another recessive allele, so depending on who they produce children with, those recessive alleles might combine to uh, give an offspring that has the disorder. So for example, um, this genetic form of deafness here caused by a recessive allele. If we have two heterozygous dominant parents uh, producing children, 75% uh, chance that any given child will have normal hearing and only a 25% chance that any given child will be deaf. It just, uh, it just depends on whether or not um, both sperm and egg are contributing a recessive allele. So a carrier, again, would be somebody that has a recessive allele, but just a single copy of a recessive allele. So they're not themselves affected by the disease, but they have the chance of passing that, the, that disease onto their offspring. And then a non-carrier would be two copies of the dominant allele. Now there are some examples of genetic disorders that are dominant in nature. And this is something that I meant to mention earlier. Don't confuse dominance with prevalence. So a genetic disorder can be dominant in nature. That means that the way that allele interacts with other alleles for a given locus, it's going to mask the effect. That doesn't mean that it's more common or prevalent in a family line, for example. So don't confuse prevalence with dominance. Um, achondroplasia is a good example of a human genetic disorder that is dominant in nature. It's a form of dwarfism. Um, basically how this works is if you have a mother that's affected with achondroplasia, that means that she's going to be heterozygous, dominant. A father that's going to be affected with achondroplasia is going to be heterozygous dominant as well. Now you're not going to see a reproducing adult who is homozygous dominant. That's because uh, an embryo that is severely affected with achondroplasia, so if a sperm cell and an egg cell come together and they both have a dominant allele for achondroplasia, um, that, that embryo, that fetus, will not survive pregnancy. So anyone that's that's affected with achondroplasia who is reproducing is going to be heterozygous dominant. So the possibilities for offspring here, we can actually have unaffected uh, children of normal height. That would be a one out of four chance for two individuals with achondroplasia to have a child of normal height. And then we would have a 50% chance of um, any given child having a contemplation. Okay, so far what I've talked about is primarily monohybrid cross, some di dihybrid cross, and simple dominant recessive inheritance patterns. There are other examples of how alleles interact with one another. Incomplete dominance is a nice example. Um, F1 hybrids of incomplete dominant allele parents will have a blend of the phenotypes. So if we have a particular type of flower here, we have a red phenotype and a white phenotype, their offspring are going to be pink, and then we'll have um, 
pink, white, and red offspring. 